years ago, and they found the following. They found that when you let these little colors just scribble, and they come up with things like that, and you ask them, what did you draw? They either don't reply, or they say uh, a drawing, or they say a circle, or they say a line. If you show them portions of, you, you ask them about from here to here, what is this? And they will, the, the respondent said, a circle. Um, if you show them this, he might say, a circle. But when you show them on the scribble, and this is blown up from, not from this, but from some other uh, drawing, you show them a, a particular piece of the drawing, of the scribble, where there is a change in direction. For instance, this here, with inverted V, and you ask a child, so what was this? And they come up with responses that are perfectly representational. They say a kite versus something like this, straight line, no break, a line, here again, a line. But when you point to this here, the child says rain. And likewise, there are things like a banana, an ant, which of course have nothing to do, when I say representational, not in terms of its uh, resemblance to the object that they're referring to, but probably um, in, in reference to something that's on their mind at that particular point. Maybe a banana that they just ate, or a kite that they'd flown, that they saw uh, uh, the, 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 the previous day that, that they liked a lot, etc., etc. And this is really important. If you ask children that young, immediately after making the scribble, they'll give you these answers. If you ask them the following day, they don't respond because I guess the memory is gone. Let's take uh, an older child. This child uh, that we're going to look at at the moment was shown this picture that I, I believe some of you will recognize. It's taken from the famous Family of Man catalog that MoMA has published uh, when they had this exhibition in 1955. So this child, just over nine years old, was shown this picture, no explanation, and there's no title. And she looked at it and looked at it, and then it was removed. And what, she, what I asked her to do is to draw, to, to draw a picture in which she shows what, oops, yeah, this is the picture, to shows what this woman is thinking of. What does she think of sitting here? And this is her drawing. And um, what the bubbles, bubble there says is, why did you leave me and choose her? So remember, she's nine years and seven months old. And she makes this drawing. And she talks about it uh, for a while. And uh, I can't give you the whole thing. It's absolutely fascinating what she said. But look at the dresses of the two women here with a heart on it. Because this is very interesting. What does she say about this? And I'll read it out because it's really important. She says, I made a dress with a large heart in the middle. She's a little fat because she's pregnant. Yes, that's how I want it. That's what she dreams because she loves him. And she's pregnant as if she were his wife. See, that's the other woman. And then she adds, first I made the tummy like this and also too swollen. So I thought, okay, I won't say she isn't pregnant for him because she's his wife, etc., etc. That's what I imagine she wants. So the point here is, first I made the dress and it was too big. And then I decided, okay, she's pregnant because there's a whole story constructed. <laughs> so she reads information off of her own drawing, which probably would have never been there, hadn't she by, by some mistake maybe even, made that dress a little um, wider than uh, intended. Um, so from a nine-year-old, we go to a second-year architecture student. And this student uh, <coughs> was designing a kindergarten 
and he had a, a program for the kindergarten, which had two classes and a number of other functions. And um, he tried a solution, found out that he wasn't happy with it, thrown it away, and now he starts anew. So he already has the program set in his head. And he says, uh, I didn't know what to do. I interviewed him after the fact. He sits in front of the blank sheet and he does something that he says he does whenever he really doesn't know what to do, which is to scribble, to, to scribble his, um, his signature. He's very proud of his signature. He's developed this wonderful signature and it's encircled here in the red circle, uh, his, his initials and, uh, and uh, he does that. You can't really see this, but over here, there's a whole series of these signatures, but they're very, very light. So you'd have to come real close in order to see this. But there's a whole series here, and, and here, and here, and one that he crossed out here. And then he says, all of a sudden I realized that my signature could be read as an enclosure of two spaces. So he, uh, change, oops, he changes it a little bit to look like this, and he says, here are my two classrooms, and here are my auxiliary uh, uh, um, rooms and services that this kindergarten looks, and in no time, he blows that up a little bit, and he comes up with this here, which then becomes this, and this becomes the plan of the kindergarten. And of course, I would have never known that if I um, hadn't had access to his sketches and I didn't ask him about it, I would have never known that. So you always have to know from the designer, him or herself, what it is that passed through their head as they were working on this. And in fact, what he was doing was no different from what the, the two-year-olds did with their, with their scribbles and what the a uh, nine-year-old did with a, with a big fat dress. So a few examples of uh, uh, sketches, again, in series, never one sketch. Here we're now talking about professionals, and we're going into a, a wider search than as a child or a second-year-old, and we get series and series of sketches. For instance, here again is uh, uh, James Sterling and the way this building here evolved. Another example is Maria Botta, the Swiss architect who is designing the, uh, the Casa Rotonda, one of the early projects quite well known, and he's busy designing the second floor, and he has to go through a whole series of very different sketches until he arrives at the uh, final plan that is uh, what was actually built at the end. And uh, I want to claim that what goes on when we sketch is, and I think that was already mentioned earlier, there's a, a loop of feedback that goes on here. When you draw something, the drawing talks back to you. Donald Chun has called that a conversation with one's material, or dialogue with one's material. The drawing talks back to you, you read information of it, you go to the next version, etc., etc. You get a loop there. So if we look at, at this uh, uh, very nice uh, sketch, which is overlaid on a hardline drawing already by Scarpa, we can actually compare this to other compositional activities such as uh, writing and composing music. The one on top is a told story uh, manuscript. In fact, this is what came back from the galleries. So it's already a hardline version of a draft. And then he scribbles over it. He was very fortunate to have uh, very early age word processor, a, a female word processor called Sonia, that was his wife, who, who took, if you read his uh, biography, he will tell you, who took this kind of stuff and at night with a candle used to copy it 
clean handwriting because um, he couldn't read his own handwriting. <laughs> and uh, many composers, this is, this is um, from Gustav Mahler, but you'll find if, if you just try and, and, and um, look even at Mozart's scores, and Mozart always claimed that he heard a whole symphony in his head, and he only had to download it from his head to paper. That's not true. If you look at his manuscript, at, at his manuscript scores, you'll see many revisions. Maybe not as many as Beethoven or, or Mahler in this case. But we all need this kind of feedback. We all need for it to come back and tell us more than we put into it to begin with. Um, it is an active, and not a passive activity. And um, the same is true for reading. You know, there's a, a, a very wonderful book by Ezra, I think it was called the, the Art of Reading or something like that, in which he says that um, you never read the text the way the writer put it on paper, you read it actively. And you find meaning in it that has to do with uh, your own set of mind. So even reading is an act, an active uh, thing. And uh, probably the same with music. And I want to um, propose the following model. This is a quite preliminary. I prepared it for this for this event, and I'll be happy to collaborate with whoever is interested in trying to either confirm or uh, or uh, find a better way of uh, modeling this. What goes on? So we have uh, this activity of sketching and in design. We have um, we always have some input information, maybe very incomplete. And, and uh, um, insufficient, but there is always some some input information. We sketch, and then there's some kind of output information, which eventually becomes a, a design proposal of some sort. In sketching, the input information is uh, transformed into something that can is useful for the output information. And this is the, the, the primary loop, which, which is like this. You know, this it goes on uh, in, in several uh, alterations. So it, it's not a one-time thing, but it's a cyclic activity that, uh, that we, we are engaged in. <coughs> this is the basic loop. But when imagery comes into play, imagine something that is not part of the, the original input information, then it may affect how we read that information, add, subtract to it, change it. That affects our sketching, and we get a different output. Um, if you think of the um, nine-year-old who had read into her drawing that uh, she imagined a pregnant lady. That's imagery affecting what goes on to get another output. On top of that, and that's probably more for professional designers, but not necessarily uniquely so, you look at your sketch and you discover new things in it. That Barbara alluded to that too. We make discoveries, and Barbara and Sakisu have shown that very, very nicely in their uh, research. We make discoveries, these discoveries become cues. Again, it changes your design. So uh, loop two and loop three are independent of one another, but they can also, of course, be tied in together because what, you, what your image is can also directly lead to discovery already in imagery. And then um, we have all these possibilities. We describe. We can describe this as following the well, input information is what's given to you. Um, the output information is, of course, the final conclusion that you arrive at. And here are the different loops. Um, 
So for, for, for loop two, which involves imagery, I would like to talk about interactive imagery because imagery informs what you're sketching, but when you read the sketching, this in turn affects what you image, in, what you imagine in your head, in your, what you see in your mind's eye. So that there's a loop there which I call interactive imagery. In, we know that images are um, of a very short duration. We can't maintain an image in our head for more than, a, when, more than a few seconds, and then they begin to fade away. But if we continuously uh, um, externalize that, put the sketch on, and read new information, we can renew the image and keep it alive for as long as needed. Um, there is a very big difference between sketchers who are amateurs, and that includes children, novices, and everybody else, and uh, skilled sketch sketchers, such as designers, uh, of, or even students at a more advanced uh, uh, phase of their studies. And um, they're able to make a much more elaborate mental synthesis, and this has been proven by a number of researchers who, wor who worked on um, on how we manage to, in our heads alone, um, combine arbitrary shapes that are given to us, let's say a square, a ball, and a hook, it could be two-dimensional, three-dimensional, and come up a combination of those that belongs to a category of objects, let's say toys or a household item, and if you do that just in your head, blindfolded, or you do it in sketching, with the help of sketching, it turns out that for non-expert sketchers, sketching doesn't make any difference. For sketchers who are experienced, you might call them ex expert sketchers, you get higher creativity rates when these results are later submitted to an assessment by experts. So, Sketching is not professional sketching, the, what we call a thinking sketch, is not something that we are born with. We are born with the ability, as we saw, an innate ability to use sketching to our benefit, to help us think, but to help us think in terms of advancing a design solution, you need to have some fluency and some, ex some experience in the uh, production of sketches. Now, yeah, the third loop here with uh, discoveries, that is easier to show than in imagery. When you are working on this loop two thing with imagery, of course, it's very difficult to actually prove that in empirical experiments unless you ask people, what did you think about? Because we have no access to what people have in their heads. But in terms of discoveries, you can show a correlation between the sketch and the final result, and what it is that happened in the sketch, especially if people think out loud and they have little aha, little big aha moments, and we can see how they discovered things in sketches. Um, the reason I'm using this particular type of model is because I want to not really compare it, but use an example of, of this um, uh, very interesting model of single loop and double loop learning that was developed by Chris Argeris and Donald Schoen way back in 1974, where they said that it, when you um, solve a problem, you arrive at, or when you learn something new, you arrive at some consequences after having applied an action strategy that you already own. You have a problem, you have an action strategy, you solve the problem. That's a single loop learning process. But if applying an action strategy is not enough, such as when the problem is really very novel, you may have to go back to your governing var variables, which are sort of all the values that you, that you hold and um, the, the set of knowledge that you think you have to apply and make 
changes in those, mainly in what you believe, in what you have up to now experienced. Maybe you have to think of different things. When you can make changes to the governing variables, that can affect your action strategy and consequently your consequences. That's double the point. Um, so what I learned from this is that there are way, ways to do things that when you, when you um, allow for more complexity to enter them into, the, into models like this, you can articulate much better what happens in processes that are really complex, such as design processes, and hence this idea of um, dividing what goes on in sketching into three different groups. Okay, here. And I want to read to you this statement by a, a designer um, who was at that time a young architect uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, participate, who participated in, this, in an experiment and in a deep briefing afterwards, she said the following. She said, I can't get very far with just thinking about it without drawing something. That would ring a bell, right, Bill? I tend to overlay when I use a uh, pencil. I also do a lot of erasing. I like to erase because I like to have a lot of lines on the page. I like fuzzy stuff, ambiguity. I can see things in it more than I can in hardline things. The ambiguity then allows you more possibilities. So sometimes I just get a lot of lines out, and then I start to see things in it. A lot of times I pick up things I think are, are important. I put down potentials, and then I erase down to them. And I couldn't have phrased it better than this young lady did. So when you uh, look at uh, uh, someone who is a, uh, as prominent an architect as Oliver Alfred, <coughs> it will echo in what he says. When he, said in an interview, he said, when I have to solve an architectural problem, the demands are so numerous that they form a maze which cannot be worked out by rational methods. The ensuing complexity prevents the basic architectural idea from taking shape. In such cases, I proceed in irrational ways as follows. I start drawing, giving free rein to my instinct, and suddenly the basic idea is born a starting point which links the numerous, often contradicting elements already mentioned, and that brings them into harmony with each other. So, discovery, and uh, if, if you look at the Alto sketches, you see that along with little doodles or uh, very, very tiny um, sketches that he makes of a building, let's say, he also draws on the same sheet, same as Da Vinci, by the way, uh, human figures at a totally different scale, things that um, allow him to think and search, conduct a very wide search. Um, so this is again the statement by the nine-year-old. I won't read it again, but we can again allude to the fact that this is a continuation of what we are probably, uh, we come into the world being able to do having that cognitive capability, which, if developed, um, leads us to, to be ex expert sketchers later and expert designers. And the last uh, slide here, I think, is um, a quote from Robin Evans, who some of you um, may know was a, a brilliant historian of architecture who unfortunately passed away uh, when he was quite young after having uh, written a few very, very interesting books recommended. Um, and he said the following, the sketch is a peculiar phenomenon. It is impossible to decide, except by dogmatic means, whether it is a projection or not. Right? He's talking about a sketch, a thinking sketch. Insofar as it is like a scheduling, it is projected. But its capacity to absorb so many other interpretations to be whatever one wants to see in it, and to multiply ambiguities and inconsistencies, make it work differently. The sketch has become a way of holding back, keeping everything in a state of suspension. 
of refusing to give it too quickly to the pretty a way of staking off the fixation of a particular figure or shape. Its amorphous, unformed, embryonic character is what distinguishes it. And again, I don't know that anyone could have put it more clearly. Thank you.